<clears throat> okay, uh, so thank you for having me here. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on with Ricardo Crescenzi, a colleague from VLC, and is a part of a broader research agenda on the effect of technology on firm dynamics and local labor markets. So let me start with a short introduction, first of all, um, on the recent history of globalization. Um, we have been hearing this term over the last few years, globalization. Uh, uh, and, and it's a term that have uh, been used together with the term deglobalization to define a new economic phases the world entered uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. In general, we can identify three different stages of recent globalization. Uh, first stage uh, during the 80s and the early 90s, uh, in which the world trade was growing at the same speed as world GDP. Then, starting with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the world entered a new phase characterized by a very rapid increase of world trade. And world trade during this phase grew much faster than world GDP. <laughs> but things changed suddenly with a financial crisis. And from mom that moment onwards, once again, uh, the world trade started to grow more or less proportionally with the world GDP. We can find a similar patterns if we focus on the global value chain. So if we focus on the share of trade in intermediate products um, during the phase of to the, the so-called hyper-globalization phase, uh, more and more in, in um, trade will, would involve uh, intermediate products. That means that more and more firms, more and more workers were involved in global value chains uh, that span across many different countries. And so we experienced a progressive segmentation of uh, the economic activities across different countries. But things stopped uh, in 2008, and here you can see from that moment onwards, we can use different measure for global value chain participation, but we still find the same result, a certain stagnation of this measure. And finally, a third chart, this is the part that is not so clear as with the previous two ones, but even if we focus on foreign direct investments, namely the decision of a firm to invest abroad, we can identify a significant change started with the financial crisis from that moment onwards. Uh, we don't see any more a clear growth of this measure, and it looks like the, um, the, the attitudes towards investing abroad have been uh, stagnating or even declining over the last few years. Um, and let me highlight that these three charts end in 2019. So I'm not saying anything about the effect of the COVID pandemic. I'm not saying anything about the effect of the war in Ukraine, but we might even be already in a, in a new different phase because these two main shocks might potentially in some way even um, in accelerate uh, the process and even make this globalization phase even more evident. And this is something that we'll be able to observe in the years to come. So what were the drivers of the global, hyper-globalization phase? Well, first of all, technology. Um, the ICT revolution led to a significant decrease in communication and coordination costs. But um, consistent with the previous decades, we also experienced a further reduction in transport costs. And then uh, policy played an important role. Uh, we, there were many multilateral, multilateral and regional trade liberalization that uh, were signed uh, during the phase between uh, the early 90s and the end of the 2000s. And, and then from a political perspective also, after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was generally an ideological shift toward capitalism in different uh, developed and emerging countries and the increase in a so-called capitalist labor force. 
uh, if we instead focus on globalization, things change from different perspectives. From a technology perspective, uh, we start, we uh, saw the emergence of new different technologies, not um, enabling technologies, but in some cases, replacing technologies, technologies that were able to replace low skill work. And let me say that this is an important factor, but at a factor for which we probably haven't seen yet the full effect, because uh, as has been highlighted by many authors, the sunk cost that firms incurred to uh, offshore the economic activity, to reassure to of, uh, offshore the economic activity abroad, probably had slowed down the process of adjustment towards a new equilibrium. Um, then probably the most relevant factors was the rapid growth of protectionism in different countries. And this is a third, and then we have a third element that is probably more recent, and is the emergence of a, a global political instability in terms of wars, trade wars, not just trade wars, unfortunately, wars in general, and a new demand for strategic autonomy that emerged in different regions in the world. Uh, let me now focus on a specific, um, a specific part of this globalization process, namely the process of offshoring, or in this case, the offshoring in the other direction, namely reshoring. We use the term reshoring uh, to um, describe the, um, uh, the process of bringing back uh, a, a certain activity that was previously, previously uh, offshored in another country. Um, so there is nowadays uh, a debate on the potential effect of reshoring and on whether uh, governments so should um, in some way support re the reshoring of economic activities. And there are four main reasons why the, sh the government should um, support the reshoring of economic activities. First of all, uh, reshoring might lead to an improvement uh, of the resilience of global value chains. Uh, during the COVID pandemics, many governments uh, found themselves unable to provide citizens with uh, elementary uh, medical uh, devices. And even in the aftermath, uh, the backlog of microchips, of batteries, of key components exposed the fragility of some key value chains. And so the idea to at least uh, near shore, so relocate at least part of the economic activity in countries that are more stable or are closer to the home countries, or in general to reduce the complexity of these value chains. And so spread, to locate them in a, in a more limited number of countries in a more concentrated region might help improve the resilience of the whole system. A second reason is to, what that have been proposed is to regain political sovereignty. And this is something that has to do with the recent history. Um, for many years, we have thought of international trade, at least some, um, some Western governments have thought of international trade also as a way to exert uh, political pressure on uh, emerging economies. But the reality of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine have shown that it can work also the other way around. And so that in certain circumstances, uh, a foreign power can exert political pressure using uh, some key inputs. And so the idea is that um, we should probably uh, become a bit more, uh, in some way, independent uh, from other countries. A third potential reason is to reduce emission. And the idea is that if a product can be produced at home, we can get rid of the emissions that are associated with the transport from a remote country. And finally, the fourth reason, and probably the most relevant reasons for many people, is to create new jobs at home. And this is uh, uh, an idea that has been spreading for a few years. And, and after 
almost three, four decades of decline of the manufacturing sector in developed economies, there is now the idea that we could somehow uh, resuscitate the manufacturing sector and bring back the uh, low skill blue collar jobs that were uh, offshored many years ago. These are two quotes from uh, two uh, protagonists of the 2016 uh, presidential campaign, well, a candidate for the primaries of the Democratic Party and the former president, both uh, stating in very different ways the support for uh, the reshoring of economic activity with the goal of bringing our jobs back to, the, to our country. But is this really the case? Can we really bring our jobs back home? Well, um, there is a recent literature um, in international trade, international business that have tried to analyze uh, reassuring dynamics. First, uh, identifying what were the main factors, the main drivers, and then trying also to um, assess the actual effects of reshoring on domestic employment. Uh, it's a rather descriptive literature. There is no, um, so there, are, there is no, there was no a real um, attempt in many cases or the possibility to identify the causal effect of reshoring on um, parent firms or domestic employment. Uh, some studies have tried to use shift share instrument, proxy war supply, but the strategy suffered for many endogeneity um, uh, issues. So in general, it's still a literature that have not been able to produce reliable results. And so there is just limited evidence of a sizable effect of reshoring dynamics on home economies. One of the most relevant paper uh, by De Bakker et al. Uh, found that foreign investment does not have a positive and significant effect of domestic employment, but rather it, it might have a positive effect on domestic capital investment. And this result has been in some way um, confirmed by many commentators in the recent years that have started to support the idea uh, that the relocation of manufacturing from low income countries might just lead to uh, an increase or an acceleration of automation at home. And so from this point, let me just briefly cover the broader topic of automation, the broader discussion around automation. Um, this are uh, just an image. Uh, two images from two uh, very well-known movies, and I think can synthesize the two opposite views of automation. So robots as co-workers and enabling technologies, or the job killer robots, the machines that are coming to replace our jobs. Um, historically, the, uh, the literature has emphasized the risk of job replacement associated with the diffusion of automation. Let me say that from a certain perspective, the fear of new technologies is inherent to human beings. We, we can find uh, newspapers, articles, books about the risk of, of new technologies in many uh, stages of our recent history, even two, three, four centuries ago. Uh, more recently, this fear has been uh, supported by uh, different contributions. Here, I just highlighted uh, three books by um, Jeremy Rifkin, Eric uh, Brion, Brion Johnson, and Martin Ford, that in very different ways all suggest that the new technologies might have a very disruptive effect on labor markets and produce mass unemployment. Um, the, recently, the economic literature have tried to develop some um, comprehensive theoretical models to account for different effects of automation on labor markets. And this is just taken from a recent uh, um, paper by Asimoglu and Strepo that identify three different 
effects of automation. Uh, the most um, simple one, uh, a displacement effect, the idea that uh, certain tasks could be automated, and so machines um, could replace certain jobs, uh, could, uh, and this is a negative effect, of course, of automation on, um, on employment. Then we have a positive effect in terms of productivity, the idea that if automation makes firms more productive, even in presence of a, a lower share of tasks that are performed by workers, there might still be an increase in the overall demand for workers because the firms can grow and so can demand more factor of productions. And a third possible effect, positive effect is the so-called restatement and is the idea that um, automation could even make certain tasks obsolete certain very simple tasks that were already um, in some way um, performed by capital and instead replace this task with new, more advanced tasks that could be performed by workers. And here the basic assumption is that the most um, advanced, the most complex tasks are always performed by workers and then progressively automation uh, in some way uh, is able to replace more and more advanced tasks. So this might also be a different way in which automation might exert a positive effect on labor markets. Of course, this simple model overlooks the reality of it in a heterogeneous labor market with workers with uh, different skills might be and are likely to be affected in very different ways. Um, these two broad topics, uh, reshoring and automation, had been considered together in some recent contributions. Uh, there is some evidence of the fact that multinationals are more likely to invest in industrial robots. And there are some studies uh, that show that uh, the exposure to foreign automation affects employment in foreign-owned firms, at least in Brazil and in Mexico. Um, there is a recent work by Kranz et al. that uh, developed a comprehensive theoretical framework that suggests that the increase in productivity of, of automation can lead to a progressive relocation of previously offshore production back to the home economy. And this is where uh, we try to contribute to the literature. Uh, in our paper, we ask ourselves whether reshoring firms replace foreign workers with domestic workers or with machines, and what are the aggregate effects of reshoring on local labor markets? Uh, first, we had to address a fundamental estimation challenge, namely the fact that the decision of a firm to reshore can have, on the one hand, an effect on the domestic production technology, on uh, firm scale composition, uh, on uh, the demand for different factors of production. But in turn, the domestic uh, production technology, the productivity of, of, of a firm, its scale composition can affect the decision whether to reshore or not. So we, we are in presence of a problem of reverse causality. And in order to solve this problem, we had to identify an exogenous shock, something that could increase the um, likelihood of, the, the, of a firm to, to, to reshore, the, um, the reshoring propensity, and this way affect domestic production technology. So we have, we make three, four main contributions to the literature with this work. First, we study the effect of local shocks on foreign affiliates of large multi-layer international business groups. We investigate the propagation of this shock through international ownership networks, and we analyze how reshoring decisions affect different worker types and firm technology. And we do so uh, within uh, a causal framework. So in practice, what do we do? Uh, first, we analyze the heterogeneous effect of local shocks on foreign subsidiaries. We focus on two broad types of shocks, local conflicts and natural disasters. We test the magnitude of the effect for different uh, shock types, and we analyze firm heterogeneity in response to this shock. 
Second, then we focus on France only, and we investigate how with shock to foreign affiliates affect the parent firm. And so first we analyze the average effect of this shock affecting one of the foreign affiliates of the parent firm on the uh, domestic employment, on the domestic performance of the firm. We, we study to what extent the shock can affect uh, its production technology and its skill composition. And we investigate the local labor market effects of supply-driven automation shocks. So beyond uh, firm and industrial boundaries. To do so, we exploit a unique set of data. First of all, a worldwide ownership network data set uh, that uh, com comprise more than 4 million firms covering over 150 countries. Then a worldwide regional, regional data on conflicts, natural disasters, uh, firm product country level data on international transactions provided by the French customs. And finally, a matched employer-employee data set covering the whole population of French workers, on average 35 million observations per year. So uh, let me quickly go through our theoretical models. That is just a very simple extension of the model proposed by Krenz et al. Here, the idea is that we have a, um, a representative firm that produces a, a certain final product. And in order to produce this final product, it uses uh, two factors, um, high-skilled workers and an intermediate good. This intermediate good is in turn, in turn produced using either uh, domestic low-skilled workers, foreign low-skilled workers, or automation capital. So uh, a firm uh, has to um, face a certain variable cost to remunerate, remunerate labor, foreign or domestic labor, and capital, and potentially a sunk fixed cost that is required to set up either a plant abroad or a machine at home. The idea is that uh, firms can, every period, have to choose how to produce the intermediate good. So every period, they can choose whether to produce this intermediate good using uh, domestic foreign workers, domestic um, low-skilled workers, uh, foreign low-skilled workers, or automation. But in presence of sunk costs, this decision is not always the same. Once a firm invests, for instance, uh, uh, abroad, so set up a foreign plant, then for the following periods, it will be cheaper for this firm to keep producing abroad. Similarly, once a firm invests in automation at home, for the following period, it will be cheaper for a firm to keep uh, using automation capital. Um, the, the key element here, the key device that we use in this model is the assumption that um, while investments in automation are there to stay, uh, invest in, investment on, um, on uh, investment on a on a on a foreign plant can be destroyed by a local shock. And here, let me specify when I talk about the local shock or natural disaster, you shouldn't just think about an earthquake that destroys a building or a plant. Or we can we can also think about a regime change that in some way destroyed an institutional network that was built over different years in a country, it can be a shock that doesn't directly affect the tangible assets in a foreign country, but significantly affect the local suppliers and forces a firm, uh, if it wants to keep producing a, that specific good abroad, to move to a different country. That in turn means uh, starting from scratch. And so again, investing in a different place. So there are different ways in which uh, um, a natural disaster or a conflict can partially or completely destroy uh, a certain investment. So coming back to the uh, basic model, we have this iterative process in which in every period, a firm has to decide what to do. And the decision will be made uh, also based on the presence of uh, a certain asset abroad or an investment already sustained in a certain automation capital at home. And so here, the, the assumption is um, we can start 
on this simple uh, diagram here from the uh, bottom left, uh, where Q, uh, that is a variable that expresses the efficiency of automation is very low, and WF, that is a wage of foreign workers, also is very is uh, is, is, is pretty low. And so we assume that under a certain uh, threshold of QT and a certain level of WF, all firms would be better off producing abroad. Then if we progressively move uh, fr from uh, top left to uh, from bottom left to top left, we observe a progressive increase in the efficiency of automation that lead us to a new, uh, a, a new square where we have a certain degree of heterogeneity across different firms based on whether they already invested abroad or not. So after a certain level of automation, firms that have not invested abroad yet, we call them uh, new entrants, might be better off investing in automation domestically instead. At the same time, firms that have already been invested abroad are still better off producing abroad. And then after a further increase in the efficiency of automation, we reach a level in which everyone is better off uh, reshoring uh, and uh, investing in automation at home. So whether they already invested or not uh, in a foreign plan, it doesn't matter anymore. Similarly, if we move from the bottom left to the bottom right, we can see that a progressive increase in wage might lead first to a situation in which new entrants, uh, so firms that have not invested yet abroad, might be better off um, some way producing at home with low skilled workers. And after a certain level, everyone is better off uh, producing, uh, producing at home with uh, low skilled workers. So now the idea in our simple model, coming back to the previous two squares, is that if we move from the bottom left to the top left, the intermediate square is a square where we have this heterogeneity based on the presence of an investment or not. And for this square, a specific shock, a specific shock to, uh, to the local asset to the foreign asset might make firms that have already invested abroad behave in the same way as firms that have not yet invested abroad. So three simple propositions. First, if the productivity of automation, QT or foreign wages increase, then the share of firms that offshore the production process decrease. Uh, invest, second point, investments in automation of foreign plants foster stickiness in firms' behavior. So a change in automation efficiency or in tariffs might affect new entrants and incumbents in different ways. Third, a natural disaster, a conflict, or in general a local shock can force firms that have already invested abroad to replace their lost asset. And in this case, incumbent firms face the same trade-offs as firms that have not invested abroad yet. So uh, this is an empirical paper. So let me just focus a bit on our data. First of all, um, we have this data set on global ownership networks. Uh, we work with uh, all this historical uh, data. It's a data set produced by Boro van Dijk. We follow a recent literature and we were able to develop an algorithm to map international ownership network using a specific iterative process. I will not go into the details, but just let me say that an international business group is a business uh, is a, a, a network built around the specific firms by identifying uh, direct control linkages, indirect control linkages by transitivity, by consolidation of voting rights, or by dominant state. What does it mean? It means that we start with a parent firm. First, we identify that firms that this parent firm can control directly uh, uh, via a majority of voting rights. Then we control firm, we identify firms that are controlled indirectly via a control of a, of a firm that controls the other firm. So in this case, parent company controls A, A controls D. So the parent company controls D uh, via an indirect control by transitivity. 
but we might also have indirect control by consideration of voting rights. In this case of subsidiary H, in this case, uh, if a parent, the parent company can uh, sum up the voting rights uh, detained by uh, uh, subsidiary E and subsidiary F, then it has a majority of voting rights on H. So we, with this algorithm applied to the whole data set, we managed to uh, identify uh, more than 4,500,000 firms uh, that belong to business groups that are uh, with a more or less 1,500,000 parent firms worldwide. A second data set we use is a data set on natural disasters and conflict. Um, for natural disasters, we retrieve, we use data retrieved from the emergency disaster data set that it was produced by the University of Leuven. This data set includes 24,000 natural disasters recorded from 1900 to present. Um, for each disaster country or observation, the data set reports the number of people affected, fatalities, and monetary damages. We managed to geolocalize these disasters so that they have uh, a specific uh, subnational regional dimension. And we map this disaster to a regional level that's comprehensive of 2,800 global administrative units. It's not the perfect, uh, um, least, um, in some way, uh, spatial data set. It's not particularly homogeneous, but of course, being subnational makes each observation a bit more comparable. We're not comparing Switzerland with China. We are comparing sub-regions of different size, but at least that are similar from different uh, perspectives. Then we also retrieve data from the Uppsala armed conflict data set data on uh, local conflicts and especially the data um, that set reports each social conflict involving at least one government. So um, we could not just use this data as they were because it was not enough to identify local shocks. We wanted to identify relevant local shocks, relevant local shocks in terms of size and in terms of predictability. So. With respect to natural disaster, we follow Nimayo et al. Uh, and we define relevant shocks as events with 10 or more people reported as killed, 100 uh, people reported as affected, and where a state of emergency was declared. In addition, we impose two further conditions. First, that no event in the same category was recorded in the regions in the previous five years, so that the event could be considered to a certain extent unpredictable, and that uh, the event had to satisfy at least one of these three thresholds, one in terms of damage over GDP, one in terms of number of people affected over total population, and one in terms of uh, people death over uh, people that over um, total population. Similarly, uh, we took the UCDP definition of conflict as an incident where armed force was used by an organized actor against another organized actor or against civilians, resulting in at least one dark death at a specific location and a specific date. And we define relevant conflicts as conflict that fulfill three conditions. First, at least five battle-related deaths per 100,000 people recorded. Second, no conflict recorded in the previous five years in the region. And third, no conflict with 100 plus deaths recorded in the whole country, not in the region, not just in the region in the previous five years. So uh, in addition, we also have access to uh, domestic French firm level data. So we use FICUS FAR dataset, mostly FAR dataset, uh, that contain balance sheet information for the whole population of private companies operating in France. Uh, we have trade data uh, on um, international transaction involving uh, a French firm and a foreign partner for a period 1994, 2021. Uh, uh, we have uh, worker level data, the ADS. Uh, we have both a cross section covering almost the whole population of French workers and a panel data set following one twelfth of the population over the whole period. So let me move to the empirical strategy. We have three different questions. First, we want to understand uh, whether idiosyncratic shock um, 
uh, to foreign affiliates lead to a reshoring of economic activities to the home countries. What we do, in, in fact, is just to, to assess whether they produce, uh, that lead the firms to divest from these countries. We are not able to assess what they are doing with this activity, whether they are just near shoring in a near country, whether they are just starting to rely on local suppliers, or whether they are actually reshoring the activity to the home country. Next, we uh, try to understand whether reshoring firms replace foreign workers with domestic workers or machine. And in this case, we run a parent level analysis in which we estimate the effect of weighted shocks on parent firm skill composition in automation capital. And finally, we assess whether uh, the aggregate what are the aggregate effects of reshoring on local labor markets. And uh, to this aim, we run a worker level analysis in which we estimate the effect of weighted shocks and neighboring shocks. So shocks recorded in neighboring plants on individual workers. Uh, let me just quickly go through uh, the um, te technical part here. Uh, this is the superior level um, estimation equation in which um, the baseline specification is a linear probability model. Well, the Verhoeven variable is a dummy that takes value equal to one if an affiliate that was active in the previous period is divested in period T. Uh, so we include a bunch of uh, country level uh, time uh, varying characteristics. Uh, we have firm level, both parent firms and affiliate firm time varying, time varying characteristics. We absorb um, the affiliate firm time invariant and observables. We cannot absorb the uh, region time uh, unobservable because otherwise we would get rid of our shock. But what we do is we identify industry J, income group E, region F, time T fixed effects. But it, it means, for instance, that we can control for the time, for the time, time varying unobservables that characterize the textile sector in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, for instance. And so with this specification, we measure the effect of uh, a shock on, uh, of a specific shock on the propensity to divest. Then we move to the uh, parent level uh, analysis. Uh, in this case, we focus, as we said before, on French firms. And in this case, uh, the dependent variable uh, Y can be uh, either the total employment of firm I, uh, the employment of occupation O of a specific occupation. Uh, uh, so we can in some way measure the effect on different worker types or the stock of uh, automation capital or even a ratio between the uh, a specific employment in a, in a certain occupation and uh, the stock of automation capital. And our main explanatory variable is WT is a weighted treatment that consider the shock on uh, the business group. And here we have the first empirical challenge because there are different ways. It's not evident how to, in some way, construct this variable. Imagine um, a specific parent firm in, in, in France that has 20 uh, foreign subsidiaries in different parts of the world. One foreign subsidiary is hit so how can we measure the magnitude of, of this shock? How, what, what effect do we expect? Uh, well, uh, we, a simple way to think about it is to consider all shocks in a, as the same uh, homo homogeneous. Of course, we still distinguish between conflicts, natural disasters, but we could say that if we set a, a certain threshold in terms of relevant shock that is high enough, but it might be not such deep, not a, a, a massive difference between a, an earthquake or a tsunami. And, and so we just uh, sum up the different shocks using the uh, employment of each affiliate as a weight. Uh, a more 
advanced approach, but potentially uh, more endogenous, would be to first estimate the average effect of the different disaster or different shock types to satisfy the condition expressed in the uh, previous slides. So uh, we might measure the magnitude of the, uh, the effect on propensity of earthquake, the magnitude of effect for a specific stop for storms, for flood, for other types of disaster, and then sum up this uh, specific heterogeneous measure using once again, uh, um, subsidiary employment as a weight. A second empirical challenge is how to measure automation. And so here we used three different uh, measures proposed by the recent literature. Uh, the one proposed by Monfiglio et al that only focuses on robotics. And so uh, in this case, we focus on imported robots. We identify a specific product code and we construct a measure of robot stock using the perpetual elementary method, and we calculate a measure of automation intensity defined as the ratio between the robot stock and the total capital stock. A second measure is narrow automation. In this case, we use exactly the same procedure as before, but instead we aggregate over 60 product categories uh, belonging to two macro categories, uh, nuclear reactors, boiler, machinery, mechanical. Yeah appliances and electrical machinery equipment and parts thereof. And then we have a third possible variable, broad automation. And in this case, we take these two law broad groups of industrial equipment and industrial tools. So then we can move to the worker level analysis. Uh, here we use as a main explanatory variable, the same uh, weighted uh, weighted shock uh, variable that we proposed before, but we in this case we focus on individual workers, uh, workers that we, we can follow over time, uh, so-called stayers, so workers that remain in a certain firm over the whole period, and we estimate the mean star equation in which we absorb uh, job spell fixed effects and time fixed effects and we control for a vector of, of time varying worker level and firm level characteristics. And finally, we extend the same estimating equation uh, also with a, an average shock recorded in U3J e plants located within a distance a radius D from worker V residence, an average shock recorded in U3K e different from J plants located within a distance radius D from worker V residence. What does it mean? Uh, it means that if I'm, let's say, if I'm um, an engineer and uh, I work in a certain uh, company, uh, this uh, a local shock in a foreign plant might affect me in three different ways. First, it might affect me directly if my plant belongs to this business group, so it's my business group that is hit. Then it can in some way affect me via um, uh, competition dynamics. So let's say uh, there is another uh, plant that belongs to the um, affected business group that is located in the nearby or at least in the same uh, product market. So potentially uh, that firm, if it, that firm decides to invest in automation and so needs more engineers, so uh, in some way might decide to, to, to might in some way put um, upward pressure on my wage, but at the same time, if there is an increase in productivity for that specific firm, that might also be at the expenses of my firm. So there might be different wage in ways in which I am affected. And then uh, there is an, a third way in which there is another plant in my local labor market that is hit by a shock, but it's a plant that belongs to an industry that is not my industry, and it's not an industry that is that have trade relationship with my industry. So in this case, the only effect is via labor, local labor market spillovers. We don't have any kind of uh, competition effects of trade relations effect. So here the idea is to just distinguish between the effect of automation on a specific firm and the effect of, of automation on a broader local labor market. So uh, let me just show you some results quickly. Um, 
the effect of natural disaster on uh, um, divestment propensity is positive. Not surprisingly, so firms that are hit by relevant disasters are more likely to divest and uh, to be divested, and 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 uh, and and firms that survive uh, record a decrease in fixed assets and employment. The same result uh, is found for conflicts, although in this case, the magnitude is much higher, not surprisingly. Uh, here, we propose some interactions. We show that firms that are located in lower layers of multi-layer business groups are more likely to be divested, and also some evidence that there is a positive effect of in some way that more upstream firms are more likely to be divested. Um, here we move to the parent firms, to the French parent firms, and we find no significant effect uh, on total employment, but some positive significant effect on tangible assets and machines. So this result might suggest that this shock do not affect firm employment, but might lead some firm to invest more in tangible assets and in machine. Here we focus on different worker types. Results are quite ambiguous. There is not a clear pattern, but there is some, some limited evidence of an effect that is more concentrated on low, a negative effect that is more concentrated on low-skilled workers and some positive effect on very high-skilled workers. Um, here we propose uh, the same result in terms of conflicts. Once again, uh, no conclusive effect on employment, but a positive and significant effect on domestic machines and ambiguous effect in terms of different worker types. Uh, finally, we propose here, as we said before, the worker level analysis. In this case, we first focus on conflicts in columns one to three. And we can see that uh, here, uh, and using in this specific specification worker level, we don't have to deal with compositional effects. We can only focus on stayers and we observe a positive effect of a conflict on wages of domestic workers that is particularly high for high skilled workers. Similar, a similar effect is found for uh, natural disasters where actually the effect is mostly driven by high skilled workers. So to sum up, uh, first of all, reshoring uh, um, in some way natural disaster do lead to the divestment of foreign firms. The reshoring is more likely the longer the ownership distance and the more upstream is the production process. We find evidence of some indirect effects on parent firms, uh, ambig ambiguous effect on parent firms' employment, uh, but probably some positive effect for high skilled workers. Uh, and that might lead, that might be uh, consistent with a, a story of uh, complementarity between automation and high skilled workers. And this result might also lead to an increase in within firm wage inequality. We also record instead a positive effect on tangible assets and automation capital, especially in capital intensive sectors. And this might be consistent with our model. And with respect to local labor market spillovers, we find this is not something I've been able to show you because we are still working on it. But early results point to a positive effect for same occupation workers uh, within 30 minutes commuting from the affected firms. And the effect is uh, concentrated among firms from different industries. So some evidence of business stealing dynamics. In terms of policy implications, well, uh, first of all, natural disaster and conflicts foster the divestment of foreign subsidiary, especially for lower layers and uh, ownership networks. And so policy promoting reshoring are unlikely to have a significant effect on domestic employment. And this is the first result. Instead, they could accelerate the replacement of routine tasks with domestic machines. And this is particularly true for skill intensive and capital intensive sectors. And with respect to the debate on the effect of automation, we can say that reshoring driven automation effects 
uh, are likely to propagate across firm and industrial boundaries in local labor markets, so well beyond the firm that is directly affected by the shock. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.